Hello, welcome back to our beginner's 3D animation course in Maya. In this part of the course, we're going to be continuing our jack-in-the-box animation. We already have the crank animating if I, as I scrub through our timeline. And then the door pops open and the jack head with its body pops up. It's a good base movement that we can use going forward to continue our animation. Let's just rewind and hit play real quick just to kind of watch it again. So one thing I probably want to tweak is the timing of the door opening. It opens really fast, and it's supposed to open very quickly. And this might even be a realistic uh, speed for like a real jack-in-the-box. But it moves so fast, and it just kind of stops. So what I'd like to do is make it just a split second slower, and also kind of have it bounce as it hits the back of its open position, as if it's hitting against the stopper that is controlling the door. So I'm going to stop the animation and scrub through till we get to the door movement. I'll select the door. If we can see the keyframes here in the timeline, I have one at 86 and one at 90. So literally four frames. That's not even a quarter of a second. We also don't want to change the door so that it is clipping through the head of the jack as it comes up out of the box. So what I'm going to do is hold down the shift key. I'm here at frame 90 where the keyframe for the lid is currently. Well then shift and just kind of click right there at frame 90. You'll see I have this little red selection. I'm gonna let go of shift and I can click and drag this forward a couple frames. Let's say let's say three frames. So now the door at its open position is at frame 93. So as we scrub through we can see right there that the the head does pop through the door. So we've gone a little bit too far. So I can hold down shift, click that frame again, and we can move it back one. Then I can click off in this time slider. And with the keyframe set at 92, which is only a two frame difference, but it can make a big difference. But at 92, the door does not get cut through by the head of the model, like so. And because the door opening is closer to the head pushing out, it almost looks like the head itself is pushing the door as opposed to the door just being released suddenly. So rewind, hit play. And it's still very fast, but it's supposed to be, but it doesn't seem quite so impossibly fast. Now, one thing we do want to happen is when the door opens, it shouldn't just come to a screeching halt at frame 92. We can kind of have it clatter against the box somewhat. For a couple of frames. So I want it to bounce back to its current position a couple of times. This is going to be very similar to the bouncing ball. So I'm going to go to, let's, I'm just going to go to a couple frames over, let's say 96. So from 92 to 96, it's just like four frames. I'm going to select the rotate X channel, right click in, key selected. So I'm keying the next point that the lid will hit. The back of the box so it hits and then kind of bounces back which we haven't done yet then it hits back against the box again and I'm just going to go another three frames or so and keyframe rotate X again and key selected so very similar to the bouncing ball we're going to go into the graph editor and adjust the animation curves for this box so it kind of bounces as it hits the back of the box here I'm going to go to my bisected view of the scene Move this down some and I have the lid selected so you see the rotate X channel highlighted press the F key to frame it in my view and we see that we're displaying starting at frame 86 when the lid starts to open to frame 92 and then we have our couple of keyframes set over here what I'm going to do is grab these keyframes and just like we did with the bouncing ball I'm going to go to tangents break tangents and it might be going right off my recording screen but it's right here break tangents and again, just like with the bouncing ball, that breaks the tangent C of these handles so we can manipulate them individually. So I'm selecting the keyframe to highlight it, which displays my two tangent handles. So then I can select this handle on this side and rotate it up like this. Select this keyframe, select this handle, and rotate it up like this. And as you can see, that's actually going up a little too far. We want this to be pretty subtle. I'm going to bring this back down so it's something like this and then I'll do the same for these handles again we want it to be subtle 
and this bounce should be a diminished effect compared to the first bounce. So now let's see what that looks like. So a little too staccato. We can adjust the timing of it, but it's essentially what we're going for. So it definitely bounces back too far. So we're going to have to make this very subtle. It might be too quick also. Actually, that doesn't look too bad. As you can see, we have to wait for the animation to start over. We can adjust our time slider by pulling this box over so that we're only looking at the group of frames that we're worrying about right now, which is this frame 85 through 100 series. So now we can watch the video repeat a few times and kind of see what we might want to adjust. It's definitely very quick. We can probably move these keyframes over a few frames. Something like this, maybe. So, this is going to take some tweaking to kind of get the right balance between the height of the jump and the speed of how it bounces against the back of the box. As we scrub through, you can kind of see what we're going for. So hit play again. That doesn't look too bad. So this is by moving our keyframes from, from 86 to 92 is when it opens. And then 92 to 97, we have our first bounce. And then from 97 to 101, we have our second bounce. And again, the value is very subtle. Let me stop the animation here. Our open position is at a rotation x of negative 120 at the apex of the jump is literally negative 112 ish at this point or negative 116 ish at this point so very subtle difference in value and we can adjust our range slider now to go back and to show more of the full animation so we can see our entire scene and see how the timing kind of compares to the rest of the scene hit play Yeah, I think that'll work nicely with the lid kind of bouncing back as it opens. So now that we have the lid situated, we can focus now on the jack itself. Let's go back to our full perspective view. So we use the former for the purposes of bringing the jack out of the box. And once the jack is completely out of the box, the lattice deformer should no longer have any effect on the jack. So I'm going to select the lattice, and then here in the channel box, I'm going to open the FFD1 inputs right here, and we have this channel called the envelope. The envelope is essentially an on and off button for the lattice. It, it's a percentage on how much the lattice is affecting the geometry that it's applied to. So whenever the jack is tucked down into the box, the lattice is having a 100% effect on the jack as the lattice moves its components around. When the jack gets up to its fullest height, the lattice should no longer have any effect. At frame 95, the jack has completely exited the box at its fullest upright position thanks to the lattice deforming the geometry. And at this point, the lattice can effectively be turned off. And using the envelope slider, we're going to do that. At 95, we can right click on envelope and key selected. It's going off my recording screen here, but there is a button for key selected in this list. Key selected. And then at frame 96, which is literally the next frame, we can say envelope is zero and hit enter. Key selected again. So between these two frames, the envelope of the lattice goes from one to zero, which means that within one frame, the lattice gets turned off. So once that happens, the lattice will no longer have an effect on the geometry, and we can use the IK spline handle to move the jack around. We can click Control H to hide the lattice so we no longer can see it. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't have effect. You can see the jack still squats down into the box when it's supposed to and comes up out of the box. The lattice animation has been completed so we can hide it so it's not covering our model as much as it is. So now we're going to work on the jack itself bouncing around. If you recall from the previous part we have a 
skeleton of joints going up through the accordion-like neck of the jack. We're using an IK spline handle, which runs a curve through our joints that the joints are being controlled by. So the shape of the curve that's inside all of this controls its shape. And then we have a handy selection handle for the curve down here. If I select that handle, I select the curve. And then I can right click and choose control vertex to display the components of the curve. And because uh, Maya tends to prioritize joint selection over geometry selection, if I try to select a CV or a control vertex of the curve by just simply mousing over these objects, it'll select the joints. So like we did before, we can use this joint selection mask to turn off joint selection so I cannot choose a joint right now when I mouse over these objects. Select my curve again, right click, control vertex, and now I have a control vertex of that curve selected. And when we move that control vertex, we adjust the shape of the curve, which, which also adjusts the shape of the skeleton, which drives the shape of the jack-in-the-box. So lots of things controlling other things in rigging animate when rigging models for animation. So these CVs, these points, are going to be our main controls for the jack's movement. And right now they're kind of clunky to get to. I have to select the curve, I have to turn off joint selection, I have to, you know, so on and so forth just to grab on to these CVs to control these points. So we're going to do a little bit of a shortcut. It's going to we're going to introduce another deformer called a cluster. Clusters are can be very complicated. All we're going to be doing is using a cluster deformer to select each individual control vertex on this curve more easily. Let me show you how we're going to do that. We're going to go to show polygons. So we hide the jack. I'm going to show joints. So we hide the joints. And I'm going to show IK handles, so we hide the IK handles. So all we have in our scene now is our curve. This is the curve that's going to be driving the neck motion of the Jack in the Box. So I'm going to right click on it, choose Control Vertex, so you can see my CVs highlight. I'll select one. Then I'll go to the Form Cluster Options. I'm going to make sure my cluster settings are reset to their default values and hit Create. So now you see this little C icon up here. If I click this C icon, I select it, and when I move it, I move that CV, that control vertex of that curve, because we've applied the control vertex, that particular control vertex, to this cluster. And a cluster, what it does, it can control multiple points. So on a model or a curve, one handle we can use to move it around with like this. But what we're really wanting to do in this situation is control each CV individually with a cluster. So the cluster contains one CV, one control vertex. So we're going to apply another cluster to the next control vertex in the curve. This one. Select it to form cluster. Select the curve, right click on it to go back to component mode, control vertex, component mode, select it, to form cluster. Do the same for the last point, right click on it, select control vertex component mode, select the CV, to form cluster. Now I have four cluster deformers for each of my four CVs of the curve. And when I grab these cluster deformers, I can move them to move those CVs. So now when the curve is being covered by joints and geometry, these cluster handles can be used to grab the CVs. However, as you can see, they're still in the same place as the CVs, so they're still going to be covered up by joints and geometry. We haven't quite solved the problem yet. But because now we have these cluster deformer objects that we can grab, we can select them. I'll make sure I deselect my curve. So I only have the four cluster deformer handles selected, the little C's. And you'll see the curve is a pink color, meaning I do not have the curve selected, but the curve is being affected by my selection, which are these four clusters. So with the four clusters selected, I can open my outliner and you can see here I have cluster one, two, three, and four handles all selected, nothing else. I can go to display, transform display, selection handles. So similar to how we did with the curve, I've displayed the selection handles for these clusters. Now that you can see the selection handles are also on the curve, which are going to be under the joints, which are going to be 
under the geometry, which are going to be hard to select. But the selection handles for objects can be moved, and that's what we're going to do next. So, with this cluster here selected, I'm going to go to component mode up here, and right here is this little plus sign. I'm going to click it to choose handle components. So when I click this cluster one handle selection handle, I can now move it over here, for example. I can do the same for these other handles. I'm just going to click them and move them over here. Same with this one. So now these handles for these CVs are way out here. Go back to object mode and you'll see that when I select these selection handles, my gizmo is over here because I'm selecting that cluster. So by selecting this handle, I select that point. And when I move that point, it moves that CV, which modifies the shape of the curve, which changes the shape of the joint chain, which then drives the shape of the geometry. <laughs> it can get very nested in uh, controllers. So now I'm going to go back to my show menu and turn on polygons, show joints, show IK handles. Then we have all this stuff back in our scene. And what I can also do is say show deformers and turn deformers all hidden. So those cluster handles are now all hidden. But these handles, my selection handles for the clusters are still visible over here. So I can grab this point and move it and control that point on the jack in the box. I can select this handle and move it. I can select this handle and move it. I can select this handle and move it. And all of these selection handles, you can see are the cluster handles. They all have translate values. So I can grab them and move them and keyframe them. And that's the goal. We wanted to have these handles that we can select to control the CVs on that curve much more easily. So now we are ready to control the animation of the jack's head moving around. And that's what we're going to do in our next part. Now that we have this all set up, we have our lid bouncing against the back of the box as it opens and our deformer is all kind of hidden out of our view so we have a clear view of what we're doing in the next part of our course we're going to be finishing our jack animation as we take control of these cluster handles and actually move our jack model around so i'll see you next time